John David and Gal So I had been putting this day off as much as filing my 2022 taxes and quitting smoking again, which I did months ago, both of those things, three months to be exact. I put off taping this episode for so many emotional reasons, dredging up pain and fear, fear of retaliation from the Boca Raton Resort and Spa, fear of breaking months of mental, physical, health repair and well-being I had built for myself, all due to the grace of the many angels that came into my life. I put this podcast off because I knew I was going to enter back into social media and I hadn't quite known how I was going to attack that and how I wanted that to look for me. I put this podcast off because I flew to California to visit my dad recently. He's got Parkinson's disease, as well as my brother who has been tasked to be dad's caregiver. That was emotional. But I did get to see a lot of my cousins. They came to, I don't know, more of an excuse, I guess, to put it off, all that stuff. But this is the day that I'm recording my fifth installment of my podcast, John David and Goliath. It may also be my last, at least for this particular John David and Goliath podcast. You see, I may be recharged from finally having a permanent home, a job and a career that I love, and my health, but the past two and a half years made me tired of the whole Boca Raton thing. And that is what I suppose Goliath wants. The Boca Raton wants me to tire and shut up and never sue them. They want me to quit fighting, which I have been actively doing since my last episode of this podcast, almost a year ago. Did I tell you I'm tired? I recently saw the Netflix series Painkiller about the opioid crisis in the U.S. Um, Have you seen it? Hold on, listeners. This episode is just going to be all over the place, so fair warning. So, Painkiller, starring Matthew Broderick. He, warning. So, Painkiller, starring Matthew Broderick. He portrayed Richard Sackler, head of the company that produced the addicting drugs, the opioids. I have to say, Matthew Broderick, adroitly uh, vacillated playing the character as fear and greed-driven, as well as intimidatingly forceful and comic. As my first aside, aside, I will tell you that when I wrote Mafia Hairdresser, the screenplay, I had a young Matthew Broderick in mind for that character, Jesse, uh, the fictional me. All right, Painkiller on Netflix. I highly recommend watching the series. It is not a buzzkill or too intense or sad, at least not to me. I felt the series was artfully done. It was entertaining as well as enlightening. Emmy Award winner Uzu Aduba played Edie Flowers, who is not an actual person, but a composite character based on the multitude of law enforcement agents who investigated Purdue Pharma, the Sacklers Company, and the False Company, and the False Claims cover-ups, and the illegal manufacturing of OxyContin by the company. I expect Uzu Aduba, she'll win another award for this role, if she already has not. She was so good, especially for her her acting at the end of the series when she was heartbroken and deflated when she found out that all her investigative work throughout the story was practically for naught. I think watching that limited series, I related to what the Edie Flowers character had to go through to garner a case and then a conviction against Richard Sackler and his crummy company. The company was clearly breaking laws at the expense of the public. The company ruined millions of lives to make money. But since the Sacklers and their company had money, they could afford the lawyers. They had the money to buy off people and companies to eradicate evidence. And they garnered exceptions to bypass laws. And frankly, they paid to get away with murder. The the law enforcement agencies only had agents, smart lawyers, sound evidence, the law on their side, the justice system, and truth, all of which was sadly shown to be a futile and an almost ineffective waste of time. Hey, we live in a country that has a system which cannot right the wrongs for society and exact punishment against criminality when up against beyond wealthy defendants and multi-million billion dollar corrupt companies. The movie presents that as a possible reality. And you know what? I think I believe it. Painkiller, the series, was not only great cinema, it sat with me in a good way. I came away with a clearer vision of where I stood with the Boca Raton. I had been working to sue the fuck out of them. The company clearly committed fraud and fraud inducement. 
as well as broke several contracts, including an agreed leave of absence contract. They broke several laws, and not just with me. So many of their staff and even members were ex, including an agreed leave of absence contract. They broke several laws, and not just with me. So many of their staff and even members were hurt by what they did. And yet, Northview Hotel Group and the Boca Raton LLC, they are a company, one of millions of companies like them. And companies like them have millions of lawyers available to them compared to a handful of lawyers available for their employees. In fact, I'm going to say that I think most employees have virtually no defense, no recourse. They certainly won't have the funds or the skills or the tenacity to even file a case against their employers, let alone find a lawyer to take their cases. That is, unless the employee was wrongfully terminated, sexually discriminated against, or hurt on the job. Those three categories are pretty much the only types of cases that employee lawyers like to work with for employees, because those types of cases are easy money for them. Any employee who has been allegedly illegally lost of fees, which is nearly impossible. Sorry to say, employees, the laws are there, but it would be hard for you to make them stick to a bad employer with money. Employers and companies have money. They have lawyers. They have the money and the lawyers which buffer themselves with time so that they can bleed any plaintiff of their time and draw out speedy trials so plaintiffs cannot afford to stick with their lawsuits against the employers. Employers bleed their victims of their victims' money so that the victim can no longer financially pursue justice against the employer company who wronged them. Sackler and Purdue Pharma had so much money that it became financially unfeasible for justice to be served. And that was the well-founded state and federal attorney's offices that were going to pursue this. The people and communities who should have been compensated by Sackler and Purdue Pharma Pharma, excuse me, barely received back even a fraction, barely received back even a fraction of what was taken from them because of law-breaking greed, which was heartlessly perpetrated upon them. Good guys don't always win. That sunk into my soul, and that truth made me feel okay, better, better about my situation with the Boca Raton and the Northview Hotel Group, the evil company, the Goliath. The first four episodes of John David and Goliath came out in February of 2023. In those four episodes, if you listened, you'll know it is about when I took a job at the Boca Raton, the famous five hotel, golf and pools, salons and spas property on the Atlantic Ocean. And it stretched inland into a huge bay. There's acres and acres of land in this Disney-esque historic behemoth business. This five hotel resort traditionally had been one of the prides of Boca Raton, Florida, until it was bought by Northview Hotel Group along with $200 million of Michael Dell's real estate investment money, which went towards the renovations once it was bought. Investment money, which went towards the renovations once it was bought. I was hired when they were supposed to reopen. I was very proud to be the only hairdresser hired other than a hairdresser named Nancy, who was the only holdout from the previous owners of the property, Waldorf Astoria. She already had a clientele who continued to see her through the pandemic and the remodel phase. So when I was the only one hired for the new owner's reopening of the new newly remodeled salon, I knew that because there were five hotels and nationally, statistically, I would receive 10% of the total hotel bookings as potential clients, not to mention the returning members and the returning customers, I was for sure going to make at least a hundred grand per year. Well, this is my update. This is the episode and what happened to me since last February after I uploaded episode four. So hold on to your seats. I'm going to rant because catching up with all this stuff, it's not going to be pretty. I th- I don't, I'm going to rant because catching up with all this stuff, it's not going to be pretty. I, th- I don't think. Brr. Wait a minute. I actually wrote that last line about four months ago. So this update may be my last podcast for John David and Goliath, but it just might end up being pretty. So I'll start out to tell you that after I uploaded episode four, a friend of mine who had been listening to my podcast called me and he asked me if I had gone to Zillow and seen the value of the resort, the Boca Raton. I was like, no, why would I do that? Because he said, before I uploaded my podcast, he had gone to Zillow to find out what the value of the Boca Raton property was. And I just wrote this. So this is now me going back and recalling. And he said it was like around a billion dollars. And I said, yeah, so? 
And then he said, now go to Zillow and look. I did. I went to Zillow and I looked up the value of the property. The Boca Raton was listed as 200 million property. The Boca Raton was listed as 200 million. And so I, I asked him what was up. He said, you did that. Your podcast did that. He was saying that because of my podcast, the value of the property had gone from 1 billion to 200 million in February of 2023. And by the way, it's January of 2024. And oh my God, where did the time go? So I didn't know what to think about that other than yay. And I mean a half-heartedly yay. You see, part of the reason I made this podcast was so that Northview Hotel Group would never make a dime from owning the Boca Raton until every one of us employees they defrauded was paid for what they did to us. Can you say class action suit? The other part of this podcast was made, maybe, in some desperate hope that the Boca Raton might sue me. That way, they would have to produce all the internal emails, which told their managers not to tell the employees that. And when you do open four new restaurants or five, I forget how many were open at the time, and there's no customers, you should tell your employees that the customers cannot make reservations because there's no phone lines. You have to tell servers and me, hairdressers and manicurists and the massage therapists and the pool attendants and the golf caddies and servers and even the chefs. You have to tell them things aren't working so they can quit and get job hours and jobs where we can make a living. You don't lie to us to keep us working until you get your phones working. <sighs> so the fact that the Boca Raton was listed as a billion dollars at Northview Hotel Group per their previous two-year schedule of buying and then flipping their past properties was prepping to list and sell the Boca Raton right on schedule, as I predicted. Every two years, they flip it, uh, whatever property they bought. But then my podcast dropped shortly after they listed their property, and then the value of the property dropped to $200 million. And then, as of just August of 2020, $200 million. And then, as of just August of 2023, which is when I began to write this update, the property is no longer listed at all. And I should have got screenshots. So I just now called, and it's January of 2024, to see if I could dig up any verification on the billion to two million. And my friend said it was, maybe it wasn't Zillow at all. Maybe it was some other commercial real estate website that he saw it on. But neither of us could find anything, nor remember what real estate portal was it Zillow had listed the property for sale. So that's strange. So I'm only assuming and hoping that any prospective buyer look closely at the property, which is soggy and water damaged, both beneath the foundations of the landfill each hotel rests on, as well as in the ceilings and the walls and in the disgusting halls behind the scene areas, all the catering foods and the dishes are stored for the Boca Raton events and their weddings. Have fun fixing that, anyone who is thinking of buying the Boca Raton from Northview Hotel Group. Furthermore, prospective buyers, you should really call the Boca Raton from Northview Hotel Group. Furthermore, prospective buyers, you should really call the historic 416-room hotel in San Francisco, California, opened in 1928, which was formerly called the Sir Francis Drake Hotel, as well as other past properties that Northview Hotel Group has flipped in their past real estate portfolios. Ask the new owner kindly, what kinds of expenses, legalities, did the new owners have to absorb when purchasing the property? And were there employee grievances? I mean, the employees who no longer work there. I would ask, what kind of exceptional team management did Northview Hotel Group actually implement when they owned the Boca Raton? Because the term exceptional team management is on the first page of Northview Hotel Group's website. And I can tell you, in the salon and spa, as well as the restaurants and the hotels, the golf club, athletic club and the hotels, blah, 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 social media team, you will find turnover of staff during their tenure of their ownership. Turnover of staff during their tenure of their ownership. And almost 100% of those people who quit or were wrongfully terminated were hired when the property was first acquired by Northview Hotel Group. And that is the opposite of exceptional team management. Additionally, I'd also recommend a prospective buyer to ask how much Northview Hotel Group has paid to manipulate their positive ratings and eliminate their negative reviews on Google and TripAdvisor. Even though I'm telling the truth in this podcast, I always thought that the Boca Raton LLC, aka Northview Hotel Group, could come after me to sue me for anything I'm saying in this podcast. That's sort of what might have been a blessing to me, but that's kind of sad, isn't it? Make a podcast for someone to sue me? That's horrible. I'm going to be honest. 
I had become bitter. But if they sued me, then I wouldn't have to sue them. Everything I'm saying here in this podcast would have come to light in the public in every criminal thing they did to me and my fellow employees, including defrauding their own members by not disclosing the phone lines were not working when they reopened under new ownership, as well as why there were not enough employees to accommodate them in the restaurants and the pools, the yacht club, etc. was actually due to the fact that employees could not make a living wage due to the phone lines being down and not because it was hard to get employees, which is what was stated. It would have just been easier if they sued me. This whole thing is exhausting and it was making me a mad person. Now back to me. After the first four episodes of my John David and Goliath podcast and having no success, I decided to move out of the dumpster fire that was Florida. I was tired from traveling by car once a month to Chicago to make ends meet and feed myself and my dogs. I moved to Florida to work at the Boca Raton Resort and Spa. That was a bust. And there was no other spa I felt could interest me, especially since I fell in love with the salon and spa I worked at in North Carolina in 2022. I asked the work there permanently and they said, yes, please. My Florida Boca Raton landlord let me break my lease, and he found a new tenant in no time who was willing to pay him $500 more per month, more than I was for my two-bedroom, two-bath rental on the beach. I patched, and I repainted the walls, and just like when I moved in, I worked with the landlord's real estate agent, Harry Momchon. Harry did my walkthrough, and Harry agreed I made the apartment look as good, if not better, than when I moved in. I expected my full security deposit of two months rent and security deposit back, which amounted to over $7,000. April 1, I was supposed to drive out of Florida with most of what I immediately needed in my car and the rest of what I wanted to keep, I put into storage. I had to sell all my new Florida furniture, which I'm still making the payments on. That new furniture and a lot of my other belongings, I ended up throwing away, giving away, or selling for pennies on the dollar. I had lost my new Florida home that I had escaped the violence and lootings of Chicago to move to. And I chose to live in was near the Boca Raton because I got the job there and the only reason I took it. One of the two elevators was new and it did not have those protective tarps to put on the walls. And the other old elevator, which would have been perfect to move my stuff out of from the fourth floor of five floors because it was due to be dismantled and replaced. But alas, the week before I started selling my new king bed and my new huge dresser, my queen guest bed and my built-in desk and the new luxury sectional sofa, my new widescreen TV, the KitchenAid mixer, the new bar stools, the chairs and the custom dining table that I built and the patio furniture. Before I can move out, all of that stuff, everything, that old elevator began to be dismantled. So I hand moved everything that I was trashing, giving and selling through Facebook Marketplace and other online selling sites down the new elevator carefully by myself. Every single box and item I carried or I hand trucked or I dollied, I couldn't trust the scavengers and people I did not know to come up to my apartment, give me their paltry amount to come up to my apartment, give me their paltry amount of cash for my stuff, only to take the stuff down the new elevator where they might have bumped or scratched the new elevator. That move was the worst. In between the painting and the patching, it took three weeks. I'm fit, but I was six years old at the time. I swear if I do get a lawyer to sue the Boca Raton, they will pay me for all that I lost and all that time and my back. So I patched and painted and my landlord's representative, Harry Momchung, said everything looked great. And then my landlord reneged on my move out date by 15 days. He moved the date back and charged me for those 15 days. And then he charged me for repainting because he wanted to. That bastard told me only two days before my April 1st move out date that the tenants would move back their move in date. And then when I was out of town and out of state, he told me that he wanted to repaint. And he surprise charged me for that too. I should have sued him. I was so hurt and mad. I thought of suing him too, but I was exhausted. I just couldn't find the time. Him too, but I was exhausted. I just couldn't find the time or the fight in me. I was trying to make a living while still trying to find a lawyer to go after the Boca Raton. That was enough for me. That was all I could bear. But, wheel, I did have this deliciously evil thought, though, at the time. A fleeting, tiny idea about what I could do to my evil landlord. Revenge much? Not that I acted on it. See, when I first moved in, I told my landlord that I would be happy to go direct deposit for my 2500 per month rent. And he said, great. 
And then he promptly emailed me his bank and routing number, which you really shouldn't do. But hey, I'm a hairdresser. I'm trustworthy. I copied his bank and routing number, and then I deleted the email in case I got hacked. Well, I couldn't use it to direct deposit anyway. Turns out that you cannot direct deposit from one personal account to another personal account more than a few times for that big amount. So I just used the number to manually fill out a deposit ticket on uh, for my check and took it to his brick and mortar bank. His bank and routing number was safe with me and his bank account and routing number on the dark web. And I will never, not that I know how to do that dark web stuff, but I'm mafia hairdresser, so I could have found out, you know, but it makes me smile just thinking about doing that. Or I did. Like I said, I told you in the past few years, we're making me nuts and angry and bitter. I'll add my only retaliation to that landlord is to say, God bless you, ex-landlord. You were an asshole. And I know that God blesses us all with the karma and lessons we need to experience in this lifetime. The law of cause and effect, good and bad, applies to you, you fucking assholian. I just want God to bless you extra. So, on April 1st, 2023, my Lakia soul was packed to the gills to move to the Appalachian Mountains in North Carolina. I mean, I was stuffing socks and t-shirts under the seats in nooks and crannies of my car. One of my 10-pound chihuahua poos was going to have to sit on my lap the entire 11-plus hours back to North Carolina. The other one would have to sit on a pillow in the uh, middle console. But before me and the dogs got on the road towards back to North Carolina, the other one would have to sit on a pillow in the uh, middle console. But before me and the dogs got on the road, I went over to a friend's house to do her hair one last time. This friend had been my guardian angel and she needed me and I was all too happy to help her out. After I did her hair, she wanted to make me a sandwich for the road, but I only planned to drive about five hours, get a hotel, sleep some, and then continue on to North Carolina, where I had secured my full-time job. Um, it was the same spa that I had worked for the previous summer. I'm going to say that all of this shit I went through with moving from Chicago and trying to open a few businesses with some friends and uh, just the whole two and a half year fiasco, Florida, Boca Raton Resort, the friends, the landlord, all of that stuff. It was all worth it because I was starting a job at a great place. And I'm so thankful for where I'm at now. Anyway, I told my friend that I didn't want a sandwich. I told her I loved my fast food diet on all my road trips. I drove from Florida to North Carolina to Chicago and back to parties. I knew that my friend smoked every once in a while in the evening. So fuck the sandwich. I asked her for a cigarette. I wasn't a regular cigarette smoker. Only when my two best friends went out to dinner with me in Chicago, I'd bum one for my friend Jan, who smoked Virginia Slim's menthols. I wasn't really a smoker, okay? But my friend, who I just did her hair, didn't just give me one cigarette. She gave me a whole pack of Marlboro Lights for my trip. And I probably would have just smoked only one that evening after I left Boca Raton in my car, packed the gills with only a fraction of my belongings I once had, and my dogs. But that night, when I pulled into a red roof inn with my Wendy's Dave's double, one patty to split for my dogs, and three hot chili sauce packets, french fries with one mayo packet, and a medium Dr. Pepper. I quickly snarfed down my food, and then I had what I thought would be my one cigarette. After my smoky treat, I thought I would get some rest and be on the road bright and early the next morning. Only this red roof inn had the kind of parking lot where a lot of only this red roof inn had the kind of parking lot where a lot of illegal activity passes through. First, there was a fight between two working girls and some guy who didn't pay one or both of them, so I called the cops. And then I had another cigarette. Then there was a fight between one man from each room on either side of mine and my dog's room on the second floor. That fight happened right outside my window, and I'm surprised neither of the men didn't come crashing through my window. I called the cops again. Both parties were arrested. How fun was that? So I had yet another cigarette while I peeked my head out the window through the blinds, watching and listening to the stuff of the Red Roof Inn and the cops recap their evening's event in the parking lot. And yes, I smoked the cigarettes in my room. Believe me, this was not a non-smoking room before I rented it for that night. By the time I had checked in and had experienced the first little skerfuffle and then police intervention and then the fight on my floor and the arrest and then the loud laughing and talking, the wrap up in the parking lot, time had passed and it was around 1 a.m. and I was beyond tired then. Around 1 a.m. and I was beyond tired then. And my dog Finnegan was also exhausted. He's sensitive to noise and yelling and sirens and crowds and just about anything outside of a, a motel room door that he can't figure out what it is. So we left at 1.30 a.m. I grabbed the dogs, the dog beds, put on my shoes and walked right past 
the police officers and the hotel staff and got into my car. And I yelled at the hotel staff, if you charge me for that room, I'll fucking sue you. Ugh. My life had become threats and wishes to sue people. I drove all morning and arrived in North Carolina in the early afternoon where I immediately unloaded my car into the cabin where I thought I was going to live all summer. At the cabin, I had the last cigarette in the pack because I smoked them all between Daytona, Florida and Blowing Rock, North Carolina, where I live. And then I took a 14-hour nap, and then me and the dogs drove to Chicago, where I had to work a week, one of the last weeks I was ever going to work in that city. I smoked cigarettes, Virginia Slim's menthols, from April 1st, well, actually April 2nd, until, uh, actually April 2nd, until October 31st of 2023. And let me tell you, about my affinity to Virginia Slim's menthols. It started long before I met Jan in Chicago. I first encountered Virginia Slim's menthols when I was working my way through um, beauty school near Glendora, California. I was 19 years old. My roommate was 17 years old, and her sister that lived with us was 14 years old. It was 1981. And if you think about a 1917 and a 14-year-old living together, and me being the man of the house, that that was normal, it was not. It was just what we kids had to do to survive. It was a little stressful. Anyway, I had been kicked out of my parents' house for being gay, and I began living with my 17-year-old gal pal who was still in high school and her younger sister. They lived with their mom a few towns away from Glendora in a tiny two-bedroom, one-bath apartment in a shitty, shitty complex whose fellow tenants were on the lowest rung of financial rankings. Their mom, Christine, was going through a time in her personal life when she was working temp jobs and sowing her wild oats by trying to date every actor who was on TV playing a detective like Beretta, Pachinko, and Simon and & Simon. The girl's mom had a list, and she was trying to meet these actors, so she had no time to take care of her two daughters. After a short while with the three girls, I got tired of pitching in and covering Christine's rent and driving her two daughters to school four towns over. I thought it would just be better for us three youngins to live together closer to where their school was and where I went to school. All three of us needed a stable home and family life, so we three kids provided that for each other by moving in together, sharing my car, as well as cooking and cleaning duties. I think me and the 17-year-old were, for a while at least, better parents to their younger sister than their mom. Crazy times, right? But I'll tell you that whole story another day. Oh, where was I? What was my point? I told you this episode would be all over the place. Um, I will tell you that when I graduated from beauty school in my fruck, there were no high schools close to us. So it was just easier to enroll the now 15 year old at the Fashion Institute of Design and Merchandise in Orange County. When the college was about to pass out the little girl's degree two years later, they found out she was underage and did not have a high school diploma. Her sister and I had, of course, lied about her age and ed education when we enrolled her. So we just told Fidham of Orange County that the press would surely love to hear about our story should they not give the 17-year-old her college degree. So at 17, she had a fashion degree and became the premier window designer, merchandiser in Southern California with her own business. You might not be able to get away with that, or a lot of what we did back then today. Yeah, it was a little stressful, but I guess that time in my life showed me how to get through this time of my life. It does show you that you can sometimes move ahead in life if you don't do it and live it the same way as everyone else tells you you're supposed to do it. This is something that I have thought about recently. You're supposed to do it. This is something that I have thought about recently and in this podcast and what I'm telling you now. I think it was all part of my life experience that helped me get through what I'm getting through now. You just do what you can. Think and do outside the box and it will all work out, albeit not the exact way you planned, but usually better. I'm going to say. Oh, Virginia Slims. <laughs> well, when I was still living in Glendora and me and the girls were still in school and living together, I was working at an in-store deli bakery at a big grocery store called Alpha Beta. You know how they have those um, bakery delis in all the grocery stores now? Well, that was new in 1981 and 1982. My store was the only one of a few. And I began first as a box boy, and then I was promoted to a donut fryer in the bakery while working my way through cosmetology school. After I lost my job as the manager of my dad's two service stations, again, because I was gay, mom's fault, 
I might add, not dads. You can read my book, Mafia Hairdresser, to hear that dads. You can read my book, Mafia Hairdresser, to hear that story. Anyway, at Alpha Beta, I worked from midnight to 8 a.m. The ugh, grease fumes that floated up from that donut fry into the hood vacuum above me made me nauseous. So the manager, who smoked Virginia Slim's menthols, told me I should smoke while I fried donuts, and then fumes wouldn't bother me. And she was right. Hey, it was the early 80s. We could smoke anywhere back then. And since I wasn't a drinker or a drug taker, nor a meditator, and I did not work out back then, and I was stressed because I was mimicking an adult as a makeshift head of household, Virginia Slim's menthols became my stress reliever. I can't tell you how many years it took for me to quit in the 80s, but by the time I moved to Chicago and met Jan in the 90s with her Virginia Slim's menthols, it had been a while. As I said, I smoked until recently. Um, now I'm not stressed. So anyway, after that Chicago trip, one of my last Chicago trips, so I had planned to stay at the cabin where I had been previously that summer before and sporadically through the winter, but that summer before and sporadically through the winter, but then an opportunity came up to rent a more permanent two bedroom, two bath condo on basically the same property where I work. So I took it. I moved again. New couch, new furniture, new microwave, new silverware. And I had to travel one last time to Chicago after that move and back to Florida one more time to get my stuff. And I burned through my savings during the past two and a half years, but I'm happy. I'm not happy, as John Rivers used to say, but I'm happy. I think you can tell my all over the place episode that you are listening to that I'm a little more loose than strategic than in the past episodes. I feel more secure, home-wise, job-wise, and I have a home. But first and foremost, I feel settled for the first time since June of 2021. In fact, I feel much like my old self again, hopefully, ready to pivot if I have to, but satisfied the way the things have worked out. I had lost my sense of humor in the past two and a half years. I had lost my sense of humor in the past two and a half years. There was the pandemic, the lootings, the carjackings in Chicago. I was right there. Then there was the move to Florida where I found my dream job that turned out to be a nightmare. And the two friends who were going to be my anchors, like my family, well, they broke up and moved away. And because I couldn't make ends meet at the Boca Raton, I had to travel by car to Chicago because I had two dogs, couldn't fly with them, to make money. And then having to work away from my new Florida home in North Carolina last summer, I carried around a lot of guilt for not being there for my dad and my brother because I couldn't get out to California to see them as much as I needed to or wanted to. I did drive there a couple times and I flew there a couple times. But the worst thing in the past two and a half years, I think was that I wasn't able to find the inspiration, time, or energy to write. And I just about disappeared online. I used to sell my books, Mafia Hairdresser and the Glowstick Gods, as well as my podcast, The Mafia Hairdresser Chronicles, online, just constantly putting it out there. I used to I had no energy. There were marriages and deaths in my groups of friends and family, and I didn't have the money, the time, or emotional bandwidth to even reach out to them. In fact, my friends and family grew apart from me, partly because I was depressed. As much or as little I tried to keep up with my friends and family and the ties that bind us, I could not. It was COVID, the economy. I was scrambling to make ends meet, then deciding to move, then again and again, and I moved again. So I'm sure there will be healing to be done there with my friends and family, but I've let myself off the hook recently. I can only do what I can do. After I arrived in North Carolina last summer, I worked steadily and found a wonderful home and friends. This summer, fall and winter, I've had um, the room to breathe. I laugh again. I work out again. And I write. In fact, I have almost completed my first nonfiction book, which is crazy. I once vowed never to write nonfiction because I never wanted the public to know. But one of the many gifts that the past years have given me is to not care what the public or my friends or my family know the real me as, at least the me that I have become. I have been humbled by my experiences. I have looked at my past and can tell you I suffered, but I have also caused suffering myself. And I've written a nonfiction book about all of the things that made me the person I am today for your entertainment, if you want to read it. And for anyone who wants to avoid the mistakes I've made, I say read this book coming up. Of course, it will have this story in it about the Boca Raton, but it will only be one little chapter because I have so many other stories to tell, and not just this one or my own little stories. This book will be about individual stories of the incredible people I've known, like the alcoholic client who you would not think was the strongest, most courageous woman you've ever met if you've judged her by her cover or her addiction. 
I've written about my early club days, dancing with the village people in the late 70s and the early 80s, and how I got to know Rock Hudson, and then Liz, Liz Taylor and her hairdressers in the early 80s, and how I got to know Rock Hudson, and then Liz, Liz Taylor and her hairdresser, Jose Eber, after Rock Hudson died. And I've written about what it was like to try and help a 14-year-old grow up when I was only 19, and how my mother fixed me up on a date after she was already dead. And would you like to know what I'm calling this book? This book is currently titled... How I Killed My Mother, and Other Two Confessions by Mafia Hairdresser. Catchy, right? And I'm also finally finishing up the third book in the Mafia Hairdresser Chronicles series, and that one's called Murder. There's an app for that. And, like the first two novels, Mafia Hairdresser and the Glow Stick Gods, it's based on my life. So I hope you'll look forward to that. In the meantime, I will be reading some pages of How I Killed My Mother on this podcast, and I'll use that title, How I Killed My Mother, not John David and Goliath. Same channel, though, so don't forget to subscribe, and please do review this podcast and listen to the entire seasons of the Mafia Hairdresser Chronicles. My books are available at Barnes & Noble online, as well as Amazon.com, and & Noble online, as well as Amazon.com, and paperback and digital. Now you might ask, what is going on with my lawsuit with the Boca Raton finish this story? That is something that only now that I can deal with. I have help, but as you might know, I have been very vocal about what they've done. I can file a huge lawsuit against them, and I can do it online, and it is affordable. What is not affordable was hiring a lawyer outright, and it was way too hard to find a lawyer in Florida who would go up against the Boca Raton LLC and Northview Hotel Group. But there are class action lawyers who want to help me if I help them, and that may be something I might be persuaded to do. Only right now, I'm lining up my ducks, and I will take my best shot before the statute of limitations runs out. Or I won't. To the staff of the Book Raton, past and present, and the members who spent way too much for those memberships, it's all so sad. If there were, if there is a lawsuit and we get there, maybe we'll all see each other again if you're subpoenaed. I'm aware that the press is aware of this podcast. A few reporters or editors have reached out to the cast. A few reporters or editors have reached out to me. They see a story, they just don't know if their efforts will be as big a story if the Boca Raton, aka Norfu Hotel Group, just files bankruptcy. One of my best friends, Armin, said something to me when I began this journey of working up to suing the Boca Raton. He said, JD, I know what they did to you was illegal, and you deserve justice, but I don't want you to pursue this if it is going to cause you to be angry and bitter. And that stuck with me. Thank God. See, after I had taken a leave of absence from the Boca Raton, and I took the job opportunity in North Carolina so that I could pay my Florida rent, as well as build up my Florida clientele for the Boca Raton Resort, I looked forward to going back to work there. But after I returned back to Florida, expecting my job at the Boca Raton to be everything I had hoped it would be, with the phone lines repaired, I thought I'd be so busy doing my craft as a colorist, hairstylist for the remainder of my days in a hair career. And I'd get health insurance. After losing it, after I started my job, health insurance. After losing it, after I started my job at the Boca Raton. Instead, I came back to Florida and I was ghosted by the managers who gave me my leave of absence, even after they called me all summer to ensure that I was coming back. And I felt that I had just wasted a year and a half of my life. I moved to Florida for that job. I worked my ass off to get it. I bought a car. I did get bitter and I got really bitter and I got angry. So I made this podcast. Was it cathartic? Maybe. I don't know yet. I know it helped me get to where I am now. But from last February or 2023, when I launched this podcast to now 2024, I can't say that I have advanced any closer to getting justice from the Boca Raton or the Northview Hotel Group. Even if this podcast has affected their business or thwarted them from profiting from flipping a once lovely spa and resort for profit, for profit's sake, I don't care about that anymore. I just don't care about so much of it. I remember it began to leave me when I started to write again last summer in my new home in North Carolina. It took all summer, and it took all fall, and it took until now, the beginning of 2024, a new year, to say that I'm me again. All the months and months of talking to lawyers who said they'd call back only to find out that they were told not to because they were members of the Boca Raton is in the past. The hope that something would be done when I reached out to Michael Dell himself, who invested in the Boca Raton with Northview Hotel Group, is not something I think about anymore. The lawyered up and all the learning about the laws the Boca Raton broke, I don't wake up going to my computer to work on this shit anymore. I stopped taking calls from past and present employees who wanted to give me more information or ask me for, for help for them. When I put all that Boca Raton shit aside, my friend's um, concern stuck in my head. I was angry and bitter, and I was not happy. 
When I stopped and rested a bit, it finally sunk in that this case could change me for the worse. And I realized that if I continued to gear up for a fight, I had, I had to let go of the angry and the bitter, or I couldn't and shouldn't fight at all because it would kill my soul. And it took an asshole landlord to make me see that, and cigarettes and managers who ghosted me. It all added up to me seeing that it all doesn't matter. Sometimes good guys don't win. Sometimes good guys don't win. And I want to be a good guy, a happy guy. Winning isn't everything, they say. What is winning then if it isn't everything? I don't know the answer to that yet, but I'd like to find out. Maybe it's a miracle. Maybe that's what winning is. It's a miracle, especially if the odds against winning are high. Well, you know what? I do believe in miracles, and I believe in angels. And now I'll be able to tell you all about those miracles and angels in my life in that podcast coming up, because that's what I'm going to focus on. I'm no longer going to be angry and fired up about taking down the Boca Raton. I would like to say, God bless all of you at the Boca Raton Northview Hotel Group and MSD Partners who fucked me, and other people who worked for your company who you also fucked, MSD Partners who fucked me, and other people who worked for your company who you also fucked in 2021 and 22. God bless you, and God bless you a lot. One of my best friends, Keith, said, you know, JD, you now need to have a vision of who you want to be and then just keep working on becoming that. So that's what I'm going to do. I don't think I had a vision of who I wanted to be up to now in the past two years anyway, or three years. I'm in the process of figuring out that now. So stay tuned. But because I feel my humor, my spirit, and my energy returning, I'm thinking that is the foundation I want to step off from in my future endeavors, including suing the Boca Raton. As I write this, this new book I'm telling you about, which includes my personal stories about my past, I can tell you that many times I used anger or an I'll show them approach to propel me to do great things. I'd like to do great things again, but from a sense of well-being and self-love. That would be a great thing and a good goal for myself. And moving forward with a lawsuit against the Boca Raton would definitely be done out of love. I w- would definitely be done out of love. I wouldn't do it if that's not possible. I think my past and my future is all caught up and I'm here right now. I thank my family and my friends. Anyway, that's it for this episode. I have decided that I will publish chapters of my new book in audio format in this podcast. Those chapters will be called How I Killed My Mother. And if you haven't already, you can support me and this podcast by buying Mafia Hairdresser the book or The Glow Stick Gods the book at Barnes & Noble online or Amazon online or MafiaHairdresser.com. And I have to thank the owners and my co-workers at West Glow Resort and Spa in Blowing Rock, North Carolina, because you gave me a warm welcome and you became my friends and you became everything to me. You made me want to come back and be a permanent co-worker with you. And the way you treat our members and our guests, as well as me, has created a work environment that is so lovely and healthy and healing to our customers and me. And I think I fit in with y'alls. So thank you. And big shout out to anybody in North Carolina who wants to go to one of the best uh, resort spas in the world, go to westglowresortandspa.com. Thanks for listening. New episodes drop most every Monday. To know more about me, John David, or read my books, as well as listen to the podcast episodes of Mafia Hairdresser, The Glow Stick Gods, John David and Goliath, or episodes of How I Killed My Mother, just go to mafiahairdresser.com. Don't forget to like and subscribe and comment at will. I am Mafia Hairdresser on social media.